to go and reminded me that he was going to Uganda, which I was very, very excited about. I thought that was really cool. But he said, I, you know, there's going to be a week that I'm there that we're going to have our worship service on Thursday night, and I'm not going to be there, and I'd love for you to be there. And I was just like, wow. He asked me that at Chick-fil-A. I was in the middle of taking an order, and I had to, like, help these people. And I was just like, well, give me a second, okay? So, yeah, if you guys are from around this area, you've probably seen me uh, at Chick-fil-A just down the road here. I've been a manager there for about four years now. Um, and as Jake has said, yeah, God has just radically changed my life big time in the last few years. Um, you know, I finally quit wrestling around with him and finally surrendered to the calling of ministry. And, uh, and I am taking steps to try to go into full-time ministry. Not only am I uh, the manager at Chick-fil-A, I'm only there a very short amount of time. Of course, a couple of you goobers I know go in there like six days out of the week. And, uh, and you don't see me there a whole lot anymore. And it's because I am now the interim youth pastor at Airline Baptist Church up in uh, Gainesville. Uh, very blessed to have that. That kind of was a whole God thing in itself um, that just kind of was blessed upon me. And, uh, and I've been enjoying it. And uh, it's a great opportunity to just realize I'm in no control of my life. <laughs> and that's a good place to be when you know that you are not in control of your life and God is just totally, totally leading you. Um, I've told a, a couple of you guys um, who have been asking me about this over the last couple of weeks, man, I had this like bawling, just raunchy, like bring down the thunder hammer of Thor message for you guys. And I was really, really excited about it. But I went on vacation last week. And if you get to go on vacation, you get refreshed. And it was very, very refreshing. I needed it. Um, but while I was there, as God tends to do, he led me in a different direction. And he showed me something that you don't expect to get when you're on vacation. You have no responsibility and you're just re in re relaxing and enjoying the beach. He hit me with this, which is a good thing to do. You never know when you're going to get that, especially on vacation. So that was cool. Um, but this is a very, very powerful message. Uh, it's going to be a familiar tune to some of you guys. But my goal, and I hope that your goal by the end of this is that you walk out these doors and that this familiar theme that you've heard all of a sudden rings a new tune in your heart. And it's going to re resonate throughout your life as well. So if you got your Bible, open up to 1 Peter chapter 3, if you have that. There's a simple verse that I'm going to read. And it's verse 18 in this chapter. And this is what it says. Christ also suffered when he died for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners that he might bring us safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. That right there, guys, that's all I'm going to read. Just that one verse. That right there, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ right there. And the effect that I hope that you get from that scripture when we're done with this message is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be heralded, it's going to be proclaimed, it's going to be announced for all the world to hear and to see in its magnificent fullness, to see that. Because that's exactly what this is. A person who hears the gospel realizes that it's good news. And what does a person do when he hears good news? You go tell it, don't you? You go tell it to a friend, you go tell it to your family. When you hear something good, you want to tell it. That's what gospel means, guys. If you've ever heard that term and you've never known, it's quite simply two words. It's good news. That's what gospel means. It's good news. And good news is for proclaiming. Now, I don't know if some of you guys have seen that, but like when I think of proclaiming, you think of like kind of the old school, like old fashioned thing where like, especially they do this in England. And in fact, they kind of still do this a little bit. It's very, very traditional. But you know, in England, especially when it comes to like royalty, that's that's something very traditional day too. Like how many of you guys, I know a lot of you girls, don't you dare not raise your hand when I ask you this because I know you did. But last year you watched Fox News, you watched CNN, and I thought it was ridiculous. But they covered the birth of a baby in England, which I guess is kind of a big deal over there because eventually he's going to be the king of England. But it was the birth of Prince George. You guys know who I'm talking about. It's William and Kate's little boy. But they covered this thing. They covered the whole thing, and it was a big deal. And I thought the goofiest thing, and, you know, but I'm a, I'm a big traditionalist. I love to do traditional things. But I loved outside of the hospital, they had that goofball dressed up in that old school, like, you know what I'm talking about, the, like, 18th century outfit with the, the big baggy pants and that big hat 
that had the huge feather sticking out of it. And, you know, he walked up there right outside where all the cameras were going off because this was his 15 seconds of fame, you know. And he took that giant scroll and he did the whole, Hear ye, hear ye, all ye citizens of England, born to you this day is your Prince George, the future king of our beloved England. That's what they do. They still do this stuff. And I love that because it's good news for those people. It was something to proclaim. It was something to rejoice in. And that's what you do, guys, when you receive good news. And that's exactly what First, or first Peter 3.18 is. It is good news for us. The gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not good news. It's mind-blowing, ridiculously good news. And not only that, but it gives us gifts, which is ridiculous. Not only is it good news, but it gives us gifts, and we get a lot of those gifts. It gives you forgiveness of sin. It gives you the promise of everlasting life. It gives you unconditional love from the God of the universe. And not only that, but it gives you power in your spirit to overcome trials and temptations that go on in your life. That's crazy stuff. It's a lot of good, good stuff. And all these are really good gifts. But guys, and this is what I want you to get by the end of all this, is I want you to wrap your mind around this, okay? We often forget that in the midst of all these gifts, we forget the greatest gift of all when it comes to the gospel. And that's God himself. Have you thought about that? God is the greatest gift that comes to us from the gospel, not the forgiveness of sins that we get, not the promise of everlasting life, not, you know, the unconditional love and the power of spirit that we receive. It's just God himself. Think about that. We get to commune. We get to be in the presence of the God that created anything and everything imaginable. That's ridiculous. You can't possibly wrap your mind around that. I still can't get my right. I was laughing on the beach last week when I was thinking about it, and somebody was walking by or jogging by, and they looked at me like, what's this guy laughing about? Like, I looked like a lunatic. I was just, like, looking up at the sky, like, laughing a little bit. This guy thought I was crazy, but I just kept laughing because I can't wrap my mind around that idea. It's, it's too big to understand. But... In the midst of all that, in the midst of God and realizing that he is the greatest gift that we get, we have to understand that we've kind of shifted away from that. We don't automatically see that. And we automatically talk about this generation going on now, but this has been going on. This is, there's been a generational shift that's kind of been getting away from God as the all-satisfying, all-powerful gift of God's love. Him himself being the greatest one. We've been shifting away from that. But if you look in the Bible, the Bible is filled with stuff that reminds us of that. The Bible teaches that the best and final gift of God's love is the enjoyment of God's beauty itself. In a very familiar psalm, the psalmist writes this in Psalm 27, 4. He says, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing that I seek the most, is that I dwell in the house of the Lord forever, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. That's what we're being reminded that we're supposed to constantly want and desire is to dwell with God, to enjoy his beauty. That's what we're supposed to be getting at. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible also teaches that the best and final gift of the gospel is that we gain Christ. And we all know that Christ is God. That's the other greatest thing that we get is that we get to gain that. One of my favorite scriptures is over in Philippians chapter 3. In verse 8, it says this, Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as rubbish, so that I may have Christ. Think about that. That's probably familiar to a couple of you guys, too. Everything in your life that you think about right now, the good, the bad, your friends, your family, your wife, your husband, whatever you've got, your most priceless possessions that you think that you have, every one of those things, garbage, rubbish, in comparison to knowing Christ. Not saying that your family or your friends are rubbish and garbage, they're not. But that's just how big and how powerful and how beautiful God is in comparison to that. But we've been shifting away from that thing. Both of these scriptures that we've just read, this, that is the all-encompassing gift of God's love through the gospel, is to see and savor and being with Christ forever. That's the greatest gift that we can receive. 
But we've turned this gospel of Christ and we've turned it into endorsement of making ourselves much bigger than anything else. We desire to make ourselves much of anything. We desire to be made much of is what we do. So all of a sudden you start taking those gifts that we just talked about. We start talking about I have forgiveness of sins. I have unconditional love. I am forgiven. I am filled with the Spirit. And all of a sudden you start having all these I statements coming out. And then all of a sudden you're being elevated. You get what I'm saying? All of a sudden you start saying all the things that the gospel does for you and what the gospel means to you that all of a sudden you, you start to distort that message. And then all of a sudden you're being elevated and that's not where it needs to be. So if you call yourself a Christ follower, there's something that you can do if you need to find out where exactly you stand in faithfulness and godless, godliness to the gospel. How many of you guys remember taking like, it was either in middle school or maybe in high school too, it was like in uh, chemistry class, I think. Y'all took like stones, you took like diamonds and stuff and you do like the acid test where you could squirt a little bit of acid on it to see the density or whatever of the stones. This is what you can do right here in terms of testing your, bio, your biblical God-centeredness and faithfulness to the gospel. You can ask yourself two questions, and I'll read that for you, and I want you to think about it for yourself, okay? Do you feel more loved because God makes much of you, or because at the cost of His Son, He enables you to enjoy making much of Him forever? Think about that. That's probably a new way for us to kind of think about that a little bit. Do you feel more loved because God makes much of you for what he does for you or at the cost of his son on the cross? All of a sudden, he enables us to enjoy making much of him forever. There's one way that you can do that. Here's another question for you. Does your happiness hang on seeing the cross of Christ as a witness to your worth or as as a way to enjoy God's worth? Think about that, too. You think about the cross. You think about what it's done for us. And we don't intentionally do that, but we do that. We, we tend to think about our worth when it comes to the cross, and you don't think about how that elevates God above everything else. So there's your acid test for you. Where's your density? Where's your strength when it comes to your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Where are you standing in terms of that? You get to see that. And we think about all these gifts we get. Those are just a couple of the gifts that we get to see. But there are literally thousands upon thousands of gifts that we receive when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm telling you guys, not one of those gifts will be enjoyed if you do not realize and you don't see the gospel's greatest gift was God himself. Not one of those things will be enjoyed if you don't put that into perspective, that God is above everything else, that he, he is the gospel. If you see that, then all else will fall into place. And all else falls right around that. That he's always got to be at the center, he's got to be at the top, and he's got to be at the foundation. He is the greatest gift of all. So you think about that. Maybe some of you are thinking, wow, like I, I just haven't thought about it in that sense before. Like it's, it's, that's kind of different. And that's where I was too. And all of a sudden, you got to kind of do a little gut check a little bit. You got to realize, how do I ensure that I'm viewing and appreciating the gospel of Christ in the right way in my life. How can I do that? Because maybe you were just thinking, wow, maybe I am making it more about myself than I should. And we tend to do that. We do. But what can we do to put God at the forefront of everything? How can we appreciate the gospel of Christ in the right way that it's intended to be? Well, there's three things that we'll look at. And the first thing is this. The first thing is divine love must be God-centered and not self-centered. Divine love must be God-centered and not self-centered here. Sadly, guys, there's been a really radical, man-centered view of love that permeates our culture today, and we see it all over the place. You see it on TV, you see it in movies, you see it in advertisements. It's everywhere. And guys, from the time that we've been raised as little toddlers, you know, our parents and anybody that's raised us, you know, we've been toddled to, to understand and believe that To be loved is being made much of. Being loved is being made much of. And it's not just being raised as children. It's in our educational philosophies as well. You see it everywhere. You see it in parenting skills. You see it at motivational seminars. Like you see those guys that are up there and say, I see potential in you. 
I see potential in you. You can do this. You can do that. You see it in all those kinds of things. And you also see it in selling techniques, guys. How many of you girls don't see those like makeup commercials and those, you know, Maybelline commercials and saying like, maybe it's Maybelline. And it's all about like you feeling and looking good. And the only way that you can feel and look good is by looking better than someone else. Feeling powerful, feeling like you're the one that needs to be elevated above all else. It's all over the place, guys. And the other sad thing is that, you know, most modern people, they can't really like wrap their mind around the fact that they're and imagine an alternative understanding of feeling loved other than feeling made much of. That's all they've really ever known is that it's all about me. It's all about, you know, numero uno coming first. And this is a familiar question that, you know, when you think about our society today, this is something that you hear is that if you don't make much of me, you're obviously not loving me. If you're not making much of me, you're obviously not loving me. Like if my wife was here right now, you know, if I were to say something to her, like, you know, if you're not making much of me, like if you don't think a whole lot about me, you're obviously not loving me. And I could say that right now, and y'all probably know my, a lot of you guys know my wife. She'd probably snap back with something like, dude, I, you're being made too much of right now. Like, you need to get down on my level. Like, you need to chill. Like, you, you don't need to be made too much of. You, you ain't as big as you think you are. Get on my level, which is kind of funny because, you know, she's a little person. But, but that's, that's where we're at. People feel like the only way that you're really loved is if you are being made much of. If it's all about us, it's totally self-centered. And the thing is, guys, if you apply that to God, if you ask that question to God, if you say, well, God, if the only way I know that you love me is if you make much about me, you're totally like weakening his worth. Think about that. You're weakening the worth of God, and it steals our final satisfaction that we get with him. If you're asking him to make much of you rather than himself, it steals that satisfaction that you get, guys, and you don't need that. And you got to be really, really, really careful with that because that distortion of that view of the gospel and that view of love, it's really, really subtle. It's really, really subtle, and you don't realize it because sometimes, guys, it can creep into our most, like, religious acts that we do. Like, think about us gathering here right now tonight. Tonight we get up here and we, you know, Brandon's up here on stage and we're worshiping and, you know, we're wanting to proclaim and praise God because of his love for us. But if all of a sudden that love is all of a sudden coming up to being underneath making much of us instead of God's love for us, then we're missing the mark. We're missing the mark, and it happens so often, guys. It happens in worship services all the time, and you don't know it because it's only in people's hearts. But if you're putting yourself and being made much of above God's love for us, then you're missing it. Who's really being praised? Think about that. Who's really being elevated? So when you think about that, you the divine love has got to be God-centered. It cannot be self-centered, guys, or you will totally miss that mark, and you will miss that gift, and you will miss those blessings in your life. So make sure that divine love in your life and, that, and your view and your idea of that is totally God-centered and not self-centered. The second thing is that God's splendor must be desired above self. God's splendor must be, bleh, must be desired above self, guys. Our fatal error is believing that wanting to be happy is all about being made much of. That's the other aspect of our society these days is you don't feel like you can be happy unless you're you know, being affirmed and you're being made much of. And it feels really good to be affirmed, doesn't it? It really does. It really feels good to have somebody acknowledge you and talk to you and, and tell how awesome you are. Like how many of you guys have taken like the, the seven love languages before? How many of you guys probably hit up on the, the affirmations? Anybody done that before? Yeah. Yep. See a couple of you guys up front here. Most of us are probably like that. That might not be one of your top ones, but at some point, affirmation is something that you desire. Affirmation is something that we want to have come to us, but you have to be very careful with that, guys, because affirmation is totally rooted in self. It has nothing to do with God. It's of no worth to God. And that kind of path to happiness, guys, and here's the beautiful thing, and I'm going to show you something here in a second. That path to happiness, it's an illusion. 
it's an illusion that a lot of people are missing these days. And the thing is, we don't understand that there are clues in every human heart, whether you've already converted to Jesus or whether you're on the fence about your faith and you haven't quite accepted God as God of the universe. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. I've got two pictures I want you to see. Go ahead and show this first picture real quick. How many of you guys know what that is? Grand Canyon, right? Anybody been to the Grand Canyon from here before? This is cool. My brother and my mom are here tonight, which is really cool. We've been to the Grand Canyon. But y'all got to understand, when me and my brother and my other brother were kids, we used to go on these, like, freaking awesome family vacations, like, every summer. Like, we, like, like those two-week vacations. And we would, like, drive. We, w- we drove out west. We've driven up to the Midwest. We've driven up the East Coast before. We, we took these awesome family vacations. And I will never forget when we went to the Grand Canyon. It is so ridiculous. Like this picture, it's kind of blurry too, but it really does an injustice to just how ridiculous that is. And they remember, they remember, this thing is like 227 miles long. It's over a mile in depth. So I'm talking about like if I was up here and was just standing here at one of those edges, I could look down and see the Colorado River that's at the bottom of it. You're over a mile away from it. And you can't, like, it, it doesn't look like that, but it is. Like, that's so crazy how big that is. And here's another little funny story. This is just kind of a side story, and it won't take us to get long off of that. But we were taking pictures at the Grand Canyon one time. So, like, picture behind me, there's a little parking lot right here. This is a story that's going to continue to come up in our family forever. But it's awesome. But there's a parking lot over here. My mom was just sitting in the car because we were getting, in, we were getting uh, some pictures made. Well, she didn't realize it. But like this was like the edge of the canyon right here before you went off. But there was, like right here, there's like a little like step off that you could get to right here. And then it went into like the chasm down there. So my little brother thought it'd be really funny to like stand there and act like we were doing like a picture. And, you know, act like he was like, oh, oh, my God. And just like jump and like duck down right there. And we both jumped down and did that. And when we looked up, you just look back at the car and you see my mom just like, she just thought that we were just like plunged into like the depths of the mile. And that was really, really funny for us until we got back in the car. And it was really, really bad for about the whole rest of the day. So that trip to the Grand Canyon was almost tainted by the fact that we like really, really ticked off our mom. But she had reason to because that was such a big gap. It was a really big hole. But it's beautiful. And I mean, you can see there's colors like mixed into it. I mean, that's that's not like from the pictures. That that's real. You can look at these rocks and the way that the sun shines on it. It's it's just beautiful. You can see like layers upon layers on rocks in there. It is just so magnificent to look at. It is so so beautiful. All right, now look at this other picture. We got one more. That is the Grand Tetons in Wyoming. Now, you just thought, well, it's just a mountain range. Well, yeah, it's just a mountain range. But we've this same trip, we went here, and we saw this. And, guys, those mountains are just like, it's, it's just like perfectly shaped and sculpted. It's just like it's, when you look at it, and you can almost see it in here, it's just, it's perfect the way they're shaped. And it's beautiful. And the lake is just like that. It's so pristine and so clear and so calm. It's just like a mirror of just looking at these mountains on that. And, you know, we went to this little pizzeria that was right across the lake from there. And, you know, the pizzeria obviously wasn't the main attraction, but, like, you could just sit there on this back patio and just enjoy this view. It was beautiful. It was beautiful, guys. And the thing is, you don't go to places like that. You don't go to places like that to increase your self-esteem. Why do we go there? You go there for joy. You go there for splendor, to enjoy things. And how can that be? How can that be if our greatest happiness comes from being made much of? Think about that. If that thing that we were just talking about, like we're totally distorting the gospel of God because we want to be made much of, but what if our happiness comes from being made much of? How can that be when you don't go to places like that to increase your self-esteem? You go there for joy. That's where that comes from, guys. You don't go there 
for your health and for your happiness to help you be made much of. Soul health and soul happiness, guys, comes from beholding not a great self, but a great splendor. So if you're ever on the fence about your faith, you think about that. You go to places like this that God sculpted himself to be made much of about yourself. You go there to enjoy a great splendor. You go there to enjoy great splendor. So God's splendor must be desired above self. And it's there. You just don't see it. That other thing is just an illusion. This is for real. So God's splendor must be desired above self. And the last thing is this. The highest, best, and final good in the gospel must be Jesus. It's going right back to what we were talking about at the beginning, guys. There's nothing else. It has to be about Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ reveals what that splendor is that we were just talking about. God calls it in, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, he calls it this, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Two verses later, he calls it this, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what that is, guys. That's what it is. That is that splendor that we get to see. It's the face of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, the thing is, since we're sinners and we have no right to desire or to be enthralled with God, God's love, it had to enact a plan. It had to enact a plan of redemption for all of us to provide that right and to provide that desire to come to God. And that's where Jesus came on the scene, guys. That's where we have that desire to come to God. That's where we have that desire to be enthralled by the beauty and the majesty of God. It's all through Jesus. He's at the forefront of everything. And for the Christian gospel to be good news, it must provide an all-satisfying and eternal gift undeserving sinners like you and me can receive and enjoy. And for that to be true, it's got to contain three things. It's got to contain three things, and you know it's for real. One, is it must be purchased by the blood of Christ. There is no way else that it could be done. It had to be purchased from the blood of Christ. That's what we celebrate tomorrow on Good Friday, is that Jesus, it's like if I was up here, and this was that Grand Canyon, and across the way was God and heaven and, and His beauty, His majesty, and there is absolutely no way on God's green earth I can get there. That's what Jesus did. He provided a way. There was no way, guys, that we could be enthralled with that or desire that because it was it's impossible that we could get there. There was no way we could do anything, guys. That's what Jesus did. Jesus provided that way for us to desire and to be enthralled by God. So it could only be done by the purchase of, of Christ's blood on the cross. Second, it must be free. It cannot be earned, guys, because y'all know this. We have all sinned, and we have fallen short of the glory of God. So there's nothing that we could do to earn that thing. It had to be free. It had to be unmerited. And that's exactly what we have. The scandal of grace that we just sang about. How, How can that be that God can just give us a free gift that we do not deserve? It's, it, it is. It's, it's a scandal. It's like, how can that possibly be that you're going to give me this? There is no way I possibly deserve this, and I'm, there's no way I can pay it back. And God's like, it doesn't matter. I love you. I love you enough. It's got to be free. It cannot be married, and that's exactly what it is. And finally, it had to be God himself. It must be God himself. You cannot, be, you cannot desire and you cannot be enthralled with God if he sent anything else to do that. If, it, if, if we could do it, then we wouldn't need God. Just like we talked about earlier, it would totally devalue his work. But since it was him, his son, God in the flesh, comes down and he did it himself. He gave us that redemption plan that would draw us to him, that would make us want to desire him more. We have that. (laughs) You see, it it makes me laugh. It's ridiculous. There's no way we deserve it. We don't deserve any of this stuff. 
I don't deserve to be up here standing in front of you guys preaching this stuff because I know where I've come from. I know the things I've done in my life. But that's where my value decreases and God increases. That's the gospel, guys. That's the good news. The good news, guys, is that the work has been done for us. We have the promise of eternal life, guys, because of what was done on the cross. It was purchased with Christ's blood. And most importantly, he raised again. He raised again from the grave. The gospel is the good news of our final and full enjoyment of the glory of God in the face of Christ. This had to be purchased for sinners at the, cr- at the cost of Christ's life. That makes his glory shine very, very bright. And the fact that that gift, this enjoyment of the free and unmerited gift of grace makes him shine all the more brightly still, guys. But the price Jesus paid and that unmerited gift that we received, that's not the gift. That's not the greatest thing we get. The gift is Christ himself. It's God. Jesus is the glorious image of God, seen and savored with everlasting joy. That is our gift. The God of the universe desires to hang out and commune with us. Like, that's unheard of. That's what makes the gospel the good news, that mind-blowing, ridiculous, table-flipping good news that we get to receive. It's unheard of. I can't believe it. So I don't know what has touched you tonight from this message. Some of it may seem so elementary to some of you guys, but I know and I see it in your eyes that something different has struck with you. You will never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll never hear that phrase the same again because you realize it has nothing to do with us. It's all about God. It's all about Jesus. He is the gospel. And that is why we get to celebrate Good Friday tomorrow. That's why we get to celebrate Easter Sunday. Because we do serve a God who is willing to come here to die for our sins. Nothing that we did to deserve it because he came. It had to be him. That was the redemption plan. To die. Brutally. But three days later, guys, he rose again. He's alive. And that's why we celebrate this weekend. He's alive. It's because of him that we have the promise of eternal life, guys. So I want to close this way. It's a really tough question to ask. But it's something I had to ask myself. And it's a gut check. It's going to get you. And that is this. If you could have heaven, and we all hear that, when we die and we're done here on this earth, we know everybody just assumes there's heaven. Well, there is if you make a choice. But if you could have heaven, if you could have all your family, all your friends, all the, the beautiful physical tastes and feelings and, and, and possessions that, that are promised to us and, and just the beautiful, glorious thing that we hear about, if you could have all of that, if you could have heaven, would you be satisfied with it if God, if Jesus were not there? Could you be satisfied with heaven and satisfied if God, if Jesus was not there? Here's the other question. Are we teaching, are we talking to our other Christian friends, or are we talking to other people in such a way that if we ask them that same question that they would answer that with a resounding no? No. Why in the world would I want to go to heaven and have all that stuff if the reason I got there was not there? The whole purpose and, you know, reason that I want to live is so that I can enjoy that splendor. I can enjoy that beauty with God and enjoy Him and all His beauty. The one thing I desire the most, the thing that I ask and seek the most, is that I dwell in the house of the Lord forever and enjoy all His perfection. Do you answer yes when I ask you that? And are we living in such a way that when we ask people that, we can do that? Are we preparing people for heaven 
where Christ himself, not his gifts, is the pr- supreme pleasure. Is that the same for you? Maybe you need to change some stuff in your life. Maybe you need to change and do some soul searching tonight before you go home. Don't wait till later on. You'll put it off. We're college students. That's what we do, right? <laughs> we, we, we put things off. We procrastinate. Don't procrastinate this. It's the most important thing that you can do in your life. Guys, above being born into an amazing family, above being married to a beautiful, amazing, God-loving woman, the most beautiful thing that I know that I have is the glory and pleasure of being in Christ's presence. All those other things are rubbish, garbage in comparison to that. That's crazy. Because all those things are good. That's just how much more better that is. And I hope that you enjoy that as well. When we celebrate the gospel of Christ and the love of God, when we lift up salvation, guys, let's do it in such a way that people will go through those things and it will see them through to God himself. Let's do that. I want to close tonight by reading this scripture that will also help you kind of wrap your mind around this a little bit. This is Psalm 70, verse 4. It says this, But may all who search for you be filled with joy and gladness. May those who love your salvation repeatedly shout, God is great. God is great. It's not that salvation is great, guys. It's that God is great. Salvation is the most precious gift that you will receive in this lifetime. But above that, God is great. Some of you guys, I know a lot of you guys, but some of you guys, I don't know, and maybe there's been a point in your life where you've, you've kind of been on the fence with your faith. Maybe you've gone through some tough stuff. Maybe tough things are going on in your life, and it's just making you wonder, well, why in the world would a God who loves me, who wants me to desire after him, is having all these bad things happen? And it makes you question your faith. Well, let me remind you of this. You can go and look at old sayings from folks. You can go to Confucius and look at what Confucius have to say. But let me remind you of this, guys. You can go across the world and you can see Confucius' grave. When you think about and you hear the people saying, well, Islam is on the rise. Islam is, is something that maybe I kind of want to look into. I want to kind of see what Muhammad had to say. You hear about Muhammad? Listen, you can go to the Middle East and you can go and you can see Muhammad's grave. But guess what, guys? You can go around the world and you can hear about this guy, Jesus. You're like, well, I want to kind of see what he did with his life. I want to go do a little sightseeing. I, I want to go see his grave and pay a little homage. Guess what? There is no grave. You can't find Jesus' grave because there is no grave. Jesus is God. Jesus is alive. So you think about all that in terms of everything else that you can think about in this world when you question your faith. There is a God who is alive. He reigns today, guys, and he desires you. Lowly, worthless, goofy you. We will continuously do things wrong in our lives, guys, but if we draw back to the heart of worship, if we draw back to God being the center of it all, and you want to go, and you want to go out, and you don't have to put on a goofy outfit like that guy in England. You don't have to wear a big hat with feathers. But you live in such a way that you're, you're proclaiming that good news. You're proclaiming that gospel of Jesus Christ. And you don't have to do it in a here to ye, here to ye manner. You just do it in the way that you live your actions, your words, and most importantly, your thoughts. Because your thoughts are just between you and God himself. You live in such a way that people see that, they will hear that good news with a resounding proclamation announcement broadcasted for everybody to hear. And it will be beautiful if you do it with God at the center of it all. So, Father, thank you so much for this word, God. Thank you, Lord, that we have that promise. We have that gift of you. Lord, we are just poured all these gifts onto us, God, from you. We, we do have forgiveness of the things that we've done wrong in our life. God, we have the promise of everlasting life with you. We have the promise of unconditional love no matter what we do. And we promise that you will power our life. But God, that is not the gift that we desire. 
Lord, I pray that you would touch our hearts in a way that you alone are the only thing that our hearts truly desire. Lord, your good news is is too good for us to just sit here and to be quiet. Lord, that we just come to go to church on Sundays. We go to church on Wednesdays, on Thursdays, and go to Bible study groups behind closed doors and then not want to go out and to proclaim out loud this good news that we have. It's too good. Lord, give us that desire. Help our hearts to want to long after you, God. I, I pray that if there's anyone here tonight, God, that is, it is struggling, Father, in their walk of faith with you, they're struggling to wonder what exactly is going on in their life, God, that they would just long after you. Father, that you would show them that beautiful splendor, God, that we would not just seek self-happiness for ourselves, God, that we would seek something beautiful. We'd go somewhere else to find joy and happiness in our souls, and it's not us. It's got to be something greater. And we know that's you, God. And I thank you for that. Lord, in light of what we get to celebrate this weekend, I thank you, Lord, that you did give us that redemption plan that would want me to desire after you. And I am enthralled with you, God. Lord, at how you would want to come and die a really, really awful death. God, so that I can have the promise of forgiven sins and eternal life with you, God. And I thank you that you are the one true God who is risen, who is alive today and is the reason why we celebrate this weekend. God, I pray that you would just give us a joy in our hearts, God, to long after you, God, that you would be the center of the gospel. Continue to be here with us tonight, God. And Father, I pray that you would just help us to come and draw close to you and to get things right with you in our walk of faith before we walk out these doors. It's all in your name we pray. Amen.